said good morning. Good morning. My name is Jason Pomeroy. I want to share with you three ideas to save our urban habitat. This is me when I was three years old. You can see that the fashion sense has somewhat changed at the time. But my connection to greenery and the natural environment has always been the same. This is me at three years old. I played in my little world, my back garden. I learned how to build a wing wagon tent. I learned how to ride my bike. And I got close to nature. It meant a lot to me, the idea of being out with the creepy crawlies of the world. But my first experience of the built environment must surely come as this awe-inspiring structure rose in front of me in London. St. Paul's Cathedral, built by Christopher Wren, astronomer royal, physicist, geometer, and architect. This Renaissance man was able to create some amazing structure that would leave a lasting impression on me to become an architect today. This building flooded with natural light, natural ventilation, without any reaching for artificial cooling or artificial lighting. Inspired me to then go on to Cambridge to study. Now this particular building is also designed by Christopher Wren. It is Trinity College Library. What I found so inspiring about this as a student in Cambridge was the fact that here, within the library itself, it is just a wash with natural light and ventilation. Without any irritable reaching after the air conditioning pump, or the artificial passage. After all, it's very important for us to be looking at a back-to-basics approach to design when we are consuming 86 million barrels of oil on a daily basis, which is equivalent to filling five pyramids of Giza. That is a lot of consumption. So what I want to talk to you today about is a return to basics. How can we distill the lessons of the past in order to provide designs for the present and disseminate the knowledge for our future generations? It's a bit like sitting in the mouth of a cave or a hermit. You see, once upon a time, as cave men and women, we would sit at the mouth of a cave and have the opportunities for natural light and ventilation. But as soon as we discovered fire, we moved deeper and deeper and deeper inside the cave. Technology has allowed us to do that. And basically, for thousands of years and millions of years, we've been moving constantly deeper and deeper and deeper inside the cave. Now it's time for us to go back to the mouth of the cave. And one of the first lessons I want to talk to you about is the idea of a zero energy development. How can we be going back to basics, looking at the lessons learned from the past in order to provide a glimpse of the future? This is the way that we normally can see our townships do row upon row of gas guzzling being of townhouses. But how can we start to kind of distill the lessons of the past in order to provide opportunities for future design? After all, you only have to look at the Kampong tradition in Malaysia, the opportunity to harvest natural light, natural ventilation, the deep overhanging roofs that provide shade and shelter from the sun and the rain. If we can start to learn the lessons of the past and distill the essences, it provides an opportunity for us to kind of create designs that are climatically responsive and socio-culturally responsive too. Being able to orientate the building to minimize the low angle sun and its solar heat get to the east and west elevations, for instance, or having deeper overhanging roofs, or planting, enhancing the planting to try and reduce the temperatures of the environment, and also harvesting the cross ventilating winds. These precepts were what actually allowed us, I mean, my previous company, to create uh, a zero energy development called the Idea House. Having the fortune to be able to look at this as a prototype house that would provide a glimpse of what future tropical living could be. Based on an academic and rigorous approach, we kind of modeled the house to allow for cross-ventilating winds to permeate through and effectively create a cool internal environment that would not rely on artificial methods of cooling or even lighting. So gradually, surely, we created this as a Lego kit of parts that could be assembled in a very, very short time frame to create what is essentially a house that really interprets the Kampong tradition but expresses it in a modernist idiom. So what of the second? Greening the urban habitat. Well, why is greening the urban habitat important? I guess I have to kind of return to my uh, garden. Um, the ability to kind of play on the swing 
for the ability to get shelter from the tree canopy. Even these sort of basic principles allows us to see what benefits trees and planting have in our uh, urban environment. After all, it is the trees that provide us with shade and shelter, and the greenery actually provides an aesthetic quality to our cities. But as we increasingly densify our cities, as in these diagrams illustrate, what we're seeing is the gradual eradication of open spaces and the correlating eradication of the greenery as well. So moving from the 18th century, a city of open spaces, to the 20th century with a city of objects, we see the gradual eradication of that urban greenery. Perhaps now in the 21st century, it is time for us to try and start replenishing the loss of that urban greenery for all of its various benefits. After all, you look at cities like Tokyo, Hong Kong, New York, awash with these tall building edifices. So how can we start to reinterpret and learn the lessons from nature and start bringing it into the city? How can we start to reinterpret the, the vertical, the diagonal, and the horizontal greenery, but actually start looking at it in terms of buildings? How can we start to reinterpret and actually bring greenery into the buildings to actually provide social, environmental, and economic benefits? After all, if you just consider one square meter of rooftop garden, it can actually hold six meters of water you just start planting rooftops and we can really start reducing flood risk. Planting rooftops can actually help reduce ambient temperatures because the, the greenery can actually absorb the heat and therefore we can see temperature reductions in cities of up to 5 degrees centigrade. And planting actually acts as a giant carbon and noxious sponge. It can absorb all of those noxious pollutants in the atmosphere. We already see cities around the world a call of arms to try and go and grab the benefits of greenery in the urban uh, habitat. Chicago has 2.5 million square feet of rooftop gardens that's effectively reduced the ambient temperatures by 5 degrees and also provides a pleasurable um, habitat for people to enjoy. How can you start then to quantify this? Well, it's all fine and well being an architect doing pretty pictures all day long and saying, well, I think this environment's going to be great because I drew it. But how can we actually start to get into the quantification of greenery? The green pot ratio method actually starts to do that. It allows us to kind of see the properties of green grass, shrubs, palms, so So you can actually assign a value to it. If you've got 12 trees on the site and you suddenly rip out the 12 trees to put up a big building, how do you try and rebalance the ecosystem? How can you start to replenish the same quantity of greenery that the 12 trees originally had? Well, this method does it. It provides an opportunity to measure the quantity of greenery, to actually start looking at greenery as a Lego kit of parts. Turf, palm shrubs, trees, trellises, vertical green walls, rooftop gardens, as a kit of parts that we can assemble in the city to create buildings that actually have a socio-economic and environmental benefit. So what of a vertical urban theory? My third and final point. This is the way that we used to socially interact before Facebook. We used to be able to kind of meet and greet in the city. It was a place for us to be able to move with ease. But with population increase, privatization of space, the increasing inner city densification. And after all, half the world's population are now living in inner city centers, and by 2050, that's soon to rise to 70%. What we're seeing is the gradual depletion of those urban spaces. Perhaps it's important for us to learn, again, the lessons from the past. How can we recreate the sense of the streets and the square and the sky? I advocate for sky courts and sky gardens as being those alternative social spaces from the 21st century. Sky ports are those green patches that you see here. They're interstitial spaces in the middle of buildings that provide an opportunity to balance the loss of those open spaces from the ground, but start to replenish by placing them in the sky. Not too dissimilar to some of those past lessons of the courts of the 18th century Paris that you see on the left-hand side, or the arcade. This is Galleria Vittorio Emanuele in Milan, a beautiful arcade that captures an element of open space that provides an ease of movement for the pedestrian 
moving from one square to another. So perhaps these sort of alternative social spaces could be a forum for us to meet and reason in the future. And after all, we're already seeing these sort of sky courts and sky gardens being incorporated in buildings, even on home turf in Singapore in the form of the National Library, Commerce Bank in Frankfurt, Marina Bay Sands. I don't fancy swimming to the edge, but certainly a 1.2 hectare park in the sky that provides an opportunity to explore the memorable views. Or even the shard in London Bridge. As the architect Renzo Piano describes it, it's going to be a virtual village for 7,200 people to live, work, play, learn, heal, relax. The mid-rise sky court being a pleasure park in the sky for people to interact. A 24-hour community fostered through space. And it is the space that provides the, the, the gel that brings people together and also the disparate parts of the building. So what we see in these examples is the fact that open space has become an integral part of buildings of tomorrow to replenish the loss of the open space. Gone are the days of simply plate stacking a series of floors to something far more diverse, far more tasty, far more enjoyable. And if we take the lettuce within the bun and the burger, maybe that is our new greenery. Why is greenery important within the vertical urban theory? Because it helps reduce the ambient temperatures, rainwater runoff, provides an aesthetic, pleasing place. But it also could feed the mouths of the additional 3 billion people walking the face of this earth by 2050. After all, Dixon Despongate has mentioned that with uh, the amount of agricultural land that we have today, how are you going to be able to feed the mouths of 3 billion people in the future? Well, perhaps you'll need a land surface area the size of Brazil. This is a way that we could potentially be doing it, looking at vertical farming. Okay, we may not have arrived at Fritz Lang's metropolis view yet, but we are slowly but surely getting there. The ability to start looking at alternative means of transport and mobility. If it is our right to have the freedom of speech and movement on the ground, why can't we actually have it in the sky? How can we start to interlink buildings in order to provide a vertical urban theory of movement and pleasure for people within tall buildings? How can we start to explore the essence of the cityscape and start to vertically extrapolate it in 90 degrees? And if the city is a mixed-use environment, how can we incorporate these mixed-use facilities within the tall building? How can we link the buildings together to foster a greater sense of movement through the city and beyond? How can we green the rooftops in order to try and reduce the ambient temperatures, reduce rainwater runoff, and create a pleasurable park in the sky for people to enjoy and help replenish the loss of those spaces on the ground? And let's celebrate the sky. Look at the Empire State Building. You know, in the first year of the Empire State Building opening up, it took more in sort of tourist receipts to get a view of Manhattan than the whole building took in rent that year. So why can't we explore those ideas? This is my vision of a virtual urban theory for a 21st century. The ability to incorporate the sky courts and sky gardens as pleasurable places to be in. Places that give back. And so in summary, I would like to leave three words with you to be able to distill, design, and disseminate. Why? Well, we need to learn the lessons from the past. I learned from Christopher Wren, and I hope that you will be able to consider some of the things I've said in order to be able to kind of look at ways of distilling the lessons from the past in order to be able to design for the present. And when we can then learn from the present, we can then disseminate that knowledge for future generations. Thank you very much.